Hi everyone and welcome to this month's Music Bar None. Today we are Klein aber Fein because basically the post-corona concert season has really hit me with a, you know, a sledgehammer and I'm so busy and I almost thought of not doing a Music Bar None but I thought that would be really sad oh. to miss a month, especially as summer is coming soon and anyway there'll be no Music Bar None over the summer. So I was really like, oh, it has to happen. And I happened to randomly like bump into three lovely people who I'd always been sort of like secretly itching to play with, but never really had the chance. And we all happened to descend on a con Leanne's concert actually. And I thought, okay, I will grab this opportunity and we are going to be performing for pieces together today. Because anyway, we all know the cocktail is more important than the music <laughs> in this point. <laughs> So, I'm taking all the four pieces from Margaret of Austria's uh, famous manuscript and I'm really happy to be delving into this repertoire because when I was a student, she was really like a la mode, she was super fashionable, suddenly lots of groups I knew were recording CDs and she seemed to be a very, this, you know, this, this manuscript seemed to be very important so I, I went to the library, I copied the facsimile, I even got it spiral bound and everything. I really did a lot of work for this manuscript. I put it on my shelf <laughs> and it's literally been sitting there for 20 years, just <laughs> gathering dust. Every time I move country, I have to you know, like, take it off and <laughs> pack it and then put it back again. And I never, somehow I never really had the right time or the right moment to delve into this repertoire. So I'm really, really happy that today, finally, is the moment because we're playing flute and harp and violin and Dussain and I thought that would be a really lovely combination for this early Renaissance chanson world. And I'm also really, really happy to like, be delving into this repertoire, not just because the music turns out to be amazing, but she was quite a dude, or rather, a dudess. Uh, she, her life was basically a Netflix reality program if you were doing Renaissance Royal Euro trash as a, <laughs> as a theme. It was crazy, and as we don't have many pieces, I'll tell you all about her life to like, fill up the time of this video. <laughs> So, she was born in 1480, and she's known as Margaret of Austria because she was the daughter of Maximiliano of, of Austria, but her mother was Mary of Burgundy, who was the co-sovereign of the Low Countries, and in fact her life ended up being much more about that part of the world than um, anything to do with Austria. And at the age of three, as was the tradition, she was engaged to the Dauphin of France and she was shipped off to the French court to be groomed to become the Queen of France, which meant she had an incredible education. She'd have been surrounded by you know, the best music, the best um, thinkers, the best dancers, the, the highest political people of the time. And we see that later in life, I think that really goes back to her roots of having such a strong input at an early age, means that then later on this all flowered when she had her own control and her own power. So she was there until she was 11, and then of course all these wranglings of international European politics meant suddenly at the age of 11, the treaties between the, the countries that wanted them to be married no longer wanted them to be married, and she was shipped back to the Low Countries, back home at the age of 11. So then, a few years later, her father then tried to make an alliance with Spain, well, Spain, which at the time was the famous moment when Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon came together to sort of begin to shape the Iberian Peninsula, and she was sent off to Spain to be betrothed to their son, John, but there was a big storm on the way, and uh, it was so bad that she actually thought she was going to die. And apparently she wrote, in a kind of a fit of teenage, ah, she wrote, Here lies Margaret, the willing bride, twice married, but a virgin, she died. <laughs> Which is just uh, quite funny. <laughs> But luckily, the storm abated. She managed to eventually get to Spain. She got married, but again, like within six months, things had changed again because her husband had died. So she had to go back home again. Third husband, or third potential husband, was Philibert of Savoy. And she went to Savoy, and at this point, I think she really began to, to bloom. This was a good marriage. 
Uh, and in fact, the government at the time was more in the hands of René, Philibert's bastard brother, who was controlling things. And she chipped away at his control until eventually Philibert and she got the power back of the lands. And they sent René off to France, exiled. And apparently then she basically took over running the Savoy uh, lands because her husband just wanted to go hunting. So... Uh, but he must have been a very good person and a, and a very um, important person in her life because she went absolutely mad when he, when he died, of course, three years later. She went, <laughs> she went absolutely grief-stricken. And uh, in fact, she was so grief-stricken, she threw herself out of a window because she couldn't bear to live without him. And uh, kind of sadly for her, but happily for us, she carried on living. But she took the heart of Philibert and she had it embalmed so that it could, and it travelled with her wherever she went. So that was obviously the one for her. <laughs> and this, at this point, she's only 24. All this has happened, and she's only 24. So, um, and in fact, around this point, her court historian and poet gave her the title. Um, let me just channel some French here. Dame de Doy, which means Lady of Mourning. And when you begin to look at the songs in this, uh, in this collection, then really it's full of, uh, you know, just retreats and, oh, so it's all very, it's full of sadness and mourning and everything. So, where have we got to? Yes. So, at this point, her family basically is ruling most of Europe by various alliances and various marriages. And because like the father and the brothers and the thing are very busy sort of running all these countries, her father decided to give the control of the low countries to her to run because there was sort of no male hanging around to do that job. So she got that job and apparently she really rocked it. She, she was a really great ruler and she then had 30 years of being a very successful kind of person full of intrigue, battles and politics, but she basically had a good life from that point on, until in her 50s, in 1530, her life drew to a close in an equally dramatic way as it has been going so far. She stepped on a piece of broken glass, and like any busy woman, she kind of like ignored the injury that happened because of it and just got on with things, but gangrene set in, and at some point they thought they, they, they decided they would um, amputate the leg, but... Unfortunately, or maybe actually fortunately, they gave her too much opium before the operation and she died in her sleep from an overdose of opium, which I think I would kind of prefer to having my leg cut yeah, off personally. Yeah. But so that, was this ama so that was the amazing life of Margaret of Austria, which I just find completely incredible. And the good thing for us is that she was really a huge patron of the arts. She had... Um, she had official court painters, had a huge library. She had a lot of um, manuscripts and chansonniers in her library full of the, the most famous composers at the time, Josquin and Ophagon and Obrecht, and her favourite composer, who was Pierre de la Rue. And what I find also cute is, it was a tradition at the time, but I think she really did it a lot, that when she wanted to give someone a present, like another noble person in the sort of European dynasty, she would often commission manuscripts and chansonniers to be made to give as a present. So it's like a, a royal version of a mixed tape for your <laughs> friend. So I, just, I find that really, really endearing. And... and um, Oh yeah, and then one thing that I find really interesting, because I, I come from England, so there's a bit of sort of English history connection, is that the young Anne Boleyn went and spent some time in the court of Margaret of Austria, and Anne Boleyn was famous for being very, very cultured, and in fact she also has a chansonnier connected to her that she commissioned or played from or you know something and I think in the next season I'd love to look into this manuscript but it's kind of an I, I sort of have the idea of the, the, the young Anne Boleyn sort of saw Margaret of Austria as this older sort of figure figure for her and uh, she saw Margaret was surrounded by these chansonniers and, and um, um, commissioning manuscripts and then she did the same thing when she was able to later on and be very active musically so so look out for that next season so yeah that's the background now you'll get to hear some of the music we're going to perform two
two pieces and then have some cocktails and then perform another two pieces and then collectively have cocktails. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so I'd really like to welcome now Maya and Liana and uh, Carolyn to come and join me and we're going to play the first piece which is by Opigum, Jeanne Doi. I should get you to come and pronounce this because it's probably completely wrong. <laughs> sort of a kind of a performance practice thing of, so this was the famous facsimile edition I got made 20 years ago from the Schola Library. Uh, it's sitting here on the music stand and we're all sitting around playing from the same, like that's, that's one piece with the four parts separately written out, which of course all the Schola people here are like, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> maybe some people out there will find that <laughs> fascinating. something jamais, where's my little list? <laughs> Pour en jamais by, ah, oh, Pierre de la Rue, which was, who was Margaret of Austria's favourite composer, and in this collection, actually, I think 70 or 80% seems to be by him, so this was really a homage to his work. And I have to check him.
humid and hot in here. <laughs> I'm just sweating like crazy. So, as I said before, this is now the most important part of the evening, and I'm just going to elegantly mop <laughs> my brow. <laughs> so, let's put the music to one side because I'm going to make a cocktail. <laughs> So each time I do music by man, I always try and find a cocktail that somehow either fits with the repertoire or the title or the feeling of the year or some special thing. And because... I should be careful, these mics will pick up everything on the table. Uh, uh, because Margaret of, Aust of Austria, she ruled over the Low Countries, I wanted to do a cocktail with Geneva, which is a very old... Um, spirit based on junipers and it was actually the inspiration for gin and I found a perfect cocktail called My Fair Lady which sounds renaissance and it seems like it's fitting for Margaret of Austria and the main ingredients was Geneva but unfortunately when I went round the shops of Basel I thought Geneva would be re I mean special but findable in Basel but when I went round to all the shops I didn't find a bottle anywhere, so I, I'm still doing this cocktail, but I'm going to do it with uh, a gin, a very kind of neutral, strong gin. And it also calls for a very special type of bitters from Italy, which again, I couldn't find anywhere. So luckily we have a lot of random <laughs> alcohol here in Freiburg, so I found that they, they also have some, some bitters, so I'm going to try it with this to see whether that works. And then the rest of the ingredients are dry white vermouth and a tiny bit of this maraschino, which is a very sweet cherry liqueur and has become a favourite of mine. A couple of months ago I was introduced to a cocktail that had it and now I try and include it in every <laughs> cocktail because it's so yummy. So, this is the cocktail. You put all these together in various amounts. I've done it already here. You add ice, you stir, and you serve. And I have to warn you guys, I haven't tried this, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's great, maybe it will be a dud, but what I'm hoping is that afterwards, once I turn the camera off, um, I have some cocktail experts in the audience, so I think we'll be able to refine the recipe. And maybe if you're watching this on YouTube, I will have then put like the refined cocktail recipe down in the description and you won't have to suffer like we might do. It might be a winner. It might be a winner. You never know. So anyway, this is already full of enough cocktail for four of us. This is a cocktail that you stir rather than shake. So I'm just going to gently stir this. Apparently you're meant to do it until the sort of the, the ice cubes lose their edges. And it takes about 30 seconds, so feel free to chat amongst yourselves. <laughs> There's normally like a little cocktail song which dates back from the first music by Nana we ever did. It's like the tenor from a Masha. But um, I think no, nobody, nobody here knows it. So. <laughs> or we could, we could learn it. <laughs> it's very simple. It's a la 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 so if you've picked that up, just join in. La 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 Nicely uh, rounded. Oh, and also, very important, there's some orange bitters that go in as well, or have gone in. Thank you. So, 
One, two, three, four. Making a big mess. We can make it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, even if it doesn't taste great, it's a pretty colour. So. <laughs> big mess. Yay! So. So I'd like to invite the three of you back again and we can cheers. So, let's see. To Margaret of Austria. Yeah. <laughs> cheers to the fairy. Cheers. Let's see. Cheers. It smells good. Cheers. 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 Well, actually, yeah, not bad. Not well, bad. Yeah. Not, well, bad. Like it's sort of, not bad. It tastes good, actually. Yes, I made an accident. When I was making it, I actually accidentally put too much of this in. <laughs> I put the measurement of this of this in. What and is, I think that works. It's a little mm -hmm. bit sweeter. It's what nice. is that sort of smokiness? Probably from the bitters. Hmm. Very nice. Yeah. Oh, it's very fragrant. Awesome. Yeah, it's like a flower inside. Mm. Yes. Wow. And cool glasses, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they were a present that I just got this afternoon mm -hmm. from Alec. Oh, oh, wow. in the corner. <laughs> Super nice. So, um, yeah, no, sorry, I just uh, took it. <laughs> Down the wrong pipe. Down the wrong pipe. <clears throat> So I have a little tradition also now in the middle of, uh, we take some sips of cocktails and we have a little chat just so that everyone can know more about you on the other side of that camera. And uh, as you guys have never played in music by none before, sadly, uh, well, now happily, um, I thought I'd just literally just do a basic hi, hi, who are you type of thing. <laughs> so let's start over here. Carolyn, tell me just sure. some... Important aspects of you and your life. What you, what's you in an essence? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Carolyn. I play the harp, uh, as is probably known by now. <laughs> um, I just finished my studies at the Schola Cantorum Basiliensis. Um, I was born in the north of Germany, then lived in the north of the American continent for a bit, and then returned here to study early music. Um, and I like food a lot. Good food really matters to me. Um, I like to windsurf. That's my other mm. hobby. Yeah. And that basically sums it up. Food and surfing and harp. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Fantastic. I will pass the question in this direction. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Maya. I play uh, early string instruments. Usually a debracha, but I've just started playing da gamba, which is like so exciting. I made my gamba debut Ooh. like actually about a month ago, which was maybe the peak of my life. <laughs> um, no, that's a, that's an extreme, but it was really wonderful. And I'm from the United States, from Madison, Wisconsin, uh, which is three and a half hours north of Chicago. And I've been living in Basel for almost four years, and I just finished my second master's degree studying with... I did my first studying with Leila Shayek, and then my second studying with Amandine Bayer. And I will uh, keep on staying here. Yeah, he's doing it. I got some oh, shooting panic. Here. No, no, no panic. panic. We don't panic. Have to invite you back. Absolutely. <laughs> have to keep playing, Yeah, it's super nice. And actually to discover that these two instruments really... I, yeah, you guys, we'll see. You'll see. You'll <laughs> see. You'll see. You'll see. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's yes. sort of cool. Uh, yes. In fact, yeah. actually, do you mind if I jump in? Like, so you're you're playing a Renaissance. I'm violin. playing a, a Renaissance. Yeah. Could you tell me? Because I actually don't know very much about this early version of the violin. Yeah. So what is being, there to tell being you? Too nerdy, I, just, what, so I guess um, this this violin is. Uh, uh, it was made by Richard Earle, who is somebody who lives in Basel, and I actually don't don't know the the exact year that it's modeled after, but I think it 
so I actually, I, I would be shy to say very specific details about the actual instrument. Um, but uh, it's basically the same as a Baroque violin, um, except uh, it just has uh, the shape of it. I don't know if people can still hear me, but the shape of it is more, is, is definitely unique. Isn't this one of the most beautiful it's things really you've gorgeous. ever seen? It's so nice. Yeah, and uh, I have it tuned um, uh, a little bit differently than uh, than the standard Baroque tuning. Um, I have it tuned G, D, A, and then a D on the top instead of an E because I find that for um, consort music, uh, especially when we're playing more in a vocal range, uh, then it, it blends really, really well to have a lower string on the top. Um, and yeah, it's really gorgeous. I don't know what to gorgeous. say. Um, yes. I'm borrowing it from the school. It's not my own instrument, but uh, but there are quite a few that are that are running around Basel. Yes. Yeah. This must be the epicenter of Renaissance violins. I don't know if you'll find one of these violins <laughs> anywhere else. else. So, I mean, yes. yeah, yes. it's really gorgeous, and it is a, uh, what's uh, it, it is made out of. Like the body of it is made. Uh, just out of one piece of wood, um, like this is all, this is all one, which is really cool. I hope I'm not making any mistakes. I don't see any. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, obviously, I do a lot of medieval music, and you might not know the answer. I might just be putting you on the spot. So there was this, I guess, this transition moment when sort of fiddle type, medieval fiddle type yeah. instruments, which is anyway like just a huge amorphous cloud because it wasn't like a family really of is. set instruments it was like everyone was making them how they wanted to and so they were different all over Europe but then I guess at some point like an instrument that was really consequently a violin yeah emerged yeah and that would be this one how much would be this one and that would be this this is yeah. this is the earliest I, version of the and violin I guess this sort of repertoire is probably the first sort of things it would have been yeah playing, absolutely. Right? absolutely yeah because there's such a there's such a big shift between, like in the middle of the 15th century, I mean this is very early 16th century, but sort of at the end of the 15th century there was this huge shift from sort of medieval thinking of three-part music and very strong fifths and octaves um, into more four-part consort playing. And at that point also m new instruments developed and arose and the concept of a family of instruments also came about, which I find really interesting. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so, <Leanne. laughs> hi, I'm Leanne. Um, I'm a historical flute player. Um, I'm from England and Australia. And I don't have very interesting hobbies like Karen. <laughs> I'm just obsessed with the flute. <laughs> and so, uh, the flute is your life. my whole life. And, um, <laughs> well, I love. I really love history, which. Um, it was a big pull for early music in general, like combining the two was a big, yeah, exciting thing for me. Sometimes, something I often ask people is, was, was there a specific moment in your life when maybe you didn't even realize it, but you sort of came in contact with early repertoires mm -hmm. and then some light bulb went on? Or like, how did you stumble into this <laughs> dark early music world? <laughs> uh, shortly before, I started playing the Baroque flute when I was 19. Um, but a few years before, I was using LimeWire, which was uh, <laughs> it was a program for illegally downloading pirated music. And um, <laughs> and I t I think I typed I ha I had a dream that I was playing in a medieval orchestra, <laughs> and I typed medieval flute into LimeWire, and it downloaded actually um, the Basse Dance of. Joyeuse vous donnerai by Arbo. Mm. I didn't know what it was. It was just called Medieval Flute. But I got obsessed with this piece. And then later I fell into the world of historical flutes. And a few years after starting Baroque Flute, I got into Renaissance Flute and rediscovered this piece. And it felt like a nice oh, yeah, connection somehow. Oh, yeah. Really like a coming home moment. Actually, really, it. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think when I started Baroque Flute, I really fell in love with the feel of the instrument in my hands and the smell of the wood and the approach to making music which felt very empowering for me 
because it, it feels like finding these old ways of thinking about music or old techniques and old soundscapes are uh, tools for making something very new and that come, come from you. So, yeah, that's two nice. moments for you. <laughs> nice. Thank you. It's interesting that you're making the connection to the instrument itself too, because, um, I mean, in the case of the harp, I think most people would associate it with like an angel with long hair playing glissandi up and down <laughs> on, a, on a really big instrument. And uh, the first time I heard the, the harp with braid pins, it was just completely enchanting. And it was also kind of like the polar opposite of what we usually associate with the harp, uh, kind of like the the naughty cousin of the of the concert Can you harp. Just uh, mention what a brie harp actually. Oh yeah, the sure. brie uh, pin actually is. Right. So you you might have heard just now that this harp has a bit of a buzz to it, and that's because the pins that hold the strings in place touch the the strings ever so lightly, and that creates that buzzing sound. And we call those pins brie pins for that reason, like the braying. Oh, like a braying of a donkey. Kind exactly. Of. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it was really the, the instrument that drew me in as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> nice. Any magic moments? I just, I was thinking about what drew me into early music and I remember my first, my first experience with Baroque violin is not what made me enjoy early music because uh, somebody showed me how to hold it and he was uh, he said oh you have to hold it down here and you have to play like this and now it's very comfortable for me but I was contorted as anything and I feel like I, I was very stiff and I was really uncomfortable and I was like I don't think I can I can do this but then I started to sing Monteverdi madrigals with a friend of mine for fun and uh, that just um, then nice. I was sold, honestly, was and sold. we continued to sing them for fun, and then sometimes people even paid us to do it, uh, um, yeah, for many years, and just getting to discover that repertoire of sort of consort, you mm -hmm. know, this, this kind of music, actually sort of this kind, I mean, almost yes. this kind of music. I think there's something really special it's about really this, this, this sort of genre, because I love being a, like, in a way you're a soloist because you're on your exactly, line, right. but also you're really important ensemble member, so you're yeah. in an ensemble but a soloist, and yeah. that's, that's really rewarding. And oftentimes it's, the texture is very thick, and mm -hmm. so you really feel like it's tactile. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can really feel that, like, um, the sound that we're making is a thick thing that's sort of moving together, and I find that really nice. Yes. Fantastic. Well, I've kind of finished my cocktail, so I think, oh gosh, I think it's time to play some more music. <laughs> That's a really nice cocktail. Thank you so much. Yeah, actually, I'm happy. I'm really happy. I was worried, but now I'm relieved. So. Compliments to the mixologist. <laughs> yes, yes <girl. laughs> Thank you, Google. <laughs> so, let's just do a bit of rearranging. I'm just gonna slide this over. That is like in a way. No. It's like a little bit of a buzz. <laughs> <laughs> it's a strong cocktail. It is, I have to say, yeah, it's, I mean, this <laughs> is no business because it's, it's only alcohol. There's no, there's nothing to soften it down apart from the ice. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's, true, it's true, now you mention it. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> we will just... <laughs> <laughs> now, first question, which, which we do I need? Which instrument do I need? <laughs> so, this piece is... The last piece in the collection called Trist Sui uh, by Anonymous, if I'm right in thinking. And uh, it's a rondo, which is this very famous poetic form where you have like sort of the main text that comes back again and again, a bit like a refrain. And then in between you have new texts, like sort of verses. And we are doing the whole rondo form, and we're going to be reflecting the poetic form by when, when it's this main text we'll all be playing, and when it's, it would have been new text, uh, it's just us three. 
So, <laughs> and it's a three-part piece. So we, we basically are our kind we will of, be doubling. Into we are merging. Blending. We're blending to be one. <laughs> Too big. <of> <laughs> <laughs> So, I definitely need a tuning note. Yeah, I should I think. probably double check yeah. this stuff.
Something I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, but I, I did. It's customized, so I, I asked for that to be. Mm -hmm. Has a little special sound hole. <laughs> Probably hard to see from there, but. <laughs> Could I have a yes? We have again a four part piece, so we all have our own lines, and uh, we have, uh, Leanna and I have like gone up to baby instruments. <laughs> uh, and it's a For Soulemont setting. So, For Sou is a very famous poem, and there's many, many uh, composers chose to set this to music, very fam uh, often very famous people. This one was someone who I'd never heard of, and I think his name is on that piece of paper there. Oh. So, if I just retrieve this. Matthias Pipela, so I've never heard of him, so, but it's a very nice piece, so maybe he should be more famous. Hmm? <laughs> 